For joining us on India Business Hour, I'm Shireen Bhan. The top story tonight, India's coronavirus count is over 2.66 lakh after yet another record rise in the last 24 hours. Now, if you look at the data put out by the health ministry, which, by the way, has been revised, close to 10,000 cases were added in 24 hours leading up to 8 a.m. this morning. Now, this includes a jump of 4,900 in active cases. Just five cities in that chart will tell you contribute to nearly 50% of the total cases in the country. Cases in Mumbai have crossed the 50,000 mark. The city now accounts for about 19% of the infections in India. Delhi contributes to over 11% of the cases. In fact, speaking of Delhi, the good news is that Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has tested negative for the virus. Remember, he had been in isolation after complaining of a fever and sore throat yesterday. So that's uh, the negative test coming in for Arvind Kejriwal. The not so good news, however, is that the Delhi government is preparing for about 5.5 lakh cases by August. Deputy Chief Minister Manish Sasodia said the state may need 80,000 beds to cope with the spike in cases by the end of July. In the past 12-13 days, the corona cases are doubled in Delhi. In the past 15 days, there will be 44,000 cases. And there will be about 6,600,000 beds. In the past 30 days, there will be 1,000,000 cases. And there will be 15,000 beds. In the past 15 days, there will be 15,000,000 beds. करीब सवा दो लाख केसेस हो जाएंगे और तैतीस हजार बेड्स की आवश्यकता होगी इकतीस इकतीस जुलाई तक करीब साढ़े पांच लाख केस पहुंच जाएंगे दिल्ली में और उसके लिए करीब अस्सी हजार बेड्स की आवश्यकता होगी ये जो प्रोजेक्शंस हैं ये पुराना डबलिंग रेट को देखते हुए की गई हैं पिछले डेढ़ दो महीने से जो एक्चुअल नंबर्स आए हैं कि लगभग 14 डेज में डबल हो रहा था अभी 12 से 13 दिन के बीच में डबलिंग रेट है उसी को ध्यान में रखते हुए क्योंकि अब हमारे पास एक्चुअल नंबर्स हैं आज जितने पेशेंट्स आ रहे हैं 30,000 के करीब क्रॉस कर गया तो आने वाले 13 या 14 दिन में ये इससे डबल होगा और अगले तीन बार इसको हमने डबल करके देखा है तो उससे ये नंबर आ रहे हैं ट्रांसमिशन है बहुत सारे लोगों में है अब वो कम्यूनिटी में कम्यूनिटी ट्रांसमिशन का उसको नाम दे सकते हैं नहीं दे सकते वो केंद्र सरकार बताएगी well, that is Delhi's health minister. The Delhi government believes that there is community transmission, at least in large parts of the city, because they haven't been able to ascertain how many people, large majority of the people who have contracted the infection, have managed to get it. The center so far maintains that there is no community transmission. If you go by the doubling rate, then the Delhi government is preparing for 5.5 lakh cases by the end of July, at the start of August, and hence preparing to put in place 80,000 beds. They're currently across the Delhi government hospital infrastructure, a little more than 8,000 beds. So you can see the tall ask there is. Now, even as cases rise, a new survey shows that large number of people in hot spots may have already been exposed to the virus and may have even recovered. Now, according to the New Indian Express, a zero survey conducted by the ICMR shows that 15 to 30 percent of people living in containment zones may have contracted the virus and, in fact, recovered. Now, this survey was conducted using 20 4,000 random samples across the 70 worst hit districts. Let me explain what a zero survey is. It is conducted by testing blood serum to find antibodies that can fight against the infection without denying the findings of a survey. A statement from the ICMR has said, and I quote, the findings appeared in media relating to the ICMR zero survey for COVID-19 are speculative and survey results are yet to be finalized, end of quote. But if you actually look at that story, the story does talk about the fact that, yes, for a lot of districts, the data is in the process of being finalized. Meanwhile, in Mumbai, two major areas of the city that emerged as hotspots earlier are seeing a drop in cases. So if you take a look at the Verli area, it reported over 60 cases on an average every day in May. In June, that has dropped to 37. It's a similar picture in Dharavi, which was also considered to be a ticking time bomb in Mumbai when it comes to COVID-19. Now, in Dharavi, the daily average of cases has dropped from 47 in the month of May to 27 so far this month. But cases are still rising in other parts of Mumbai, and the city is ramping up healthcare capacity. The commissioner of the Mumbai Metropolitan Region Development Authority spoke to CNBC TV18 about the plans to expand capacity at the COVID hospital in BKC, which is the makeshift facility that's been set up. Well, phase one was specially made for semi critical patients. So, uh, those who, who require isolation facilities, like people uh, coming from slum areas, they cannot isolate themselves at their home. So, they need uh, space to. Uh, go to isolation. So this facility, first facility was created 
keeping in mind the slum people of and then phase one. The phase two basically is coming up with 108 beds ICU facility with one unit of dialysis also attached to it where 16 to 18 beds of dialysis will be there. So uh, this ICU facility and along with that, so completely around 2000 beds we will be creating out of that 108 beds will be ICU and then uh, 20 around 20 beds will be uh, dialysis facility and rest of them will be 50 50 percent oxygen and non-oxygen facilities well that is the mmrda chief on the new covid facility that's being set up in bkc this is phase two remember phase one is already operational another 2000 beds will be added in phase two should be ready by the 15th of june now in another key development the world health organization is backtracking on an earlier claim a new study by the who shows that asymptomatic spread of the virus I quote, is very rare. Now, majority of the COVID-19 cases are either asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. The WHO had earlier indicated that the virus may spread even if people didn't show any symptoms based on preliminary evidence. The organization is now advising governments to focus on detecting and isolating infected people that show symptoms. So they are saying that should be the focus, not asymptomatic, and also believe that asymptomatic uh, people who may in fact test positive may not necessarily be big spreaders. A quick check of some of the other headlines that we're tracking this evening. BJP leader Jyotiraditya Sindhya and his mother have tested positive for COVID-19. They've been admitted to a private hospital in the capital. BMC's Deputy Municipal Commissioner Shirish Dixit dies from COVID-19 three days after testing positive. Dixit was 54 and asymptomatic. So far, 55 BMC employees have died from the COVID-19 infection. Health ministries deployed high-level teams across 15 states and union territories, including Maharashtra and Telangana teams, to provide technical support to local bodies and facilitate the management of the COVID-19 outbreak. The centre issues fresh guidelines for its offices after many government officials test positive for COVID-19. The government says only asymptomatic staff will be allowed to come to work. Anyone with fever or even a mild cough should stay at home. Officials living in containment zones have been asked to work from home till the area is denotified. Mumbai's municipal body, the BMC, amends lockdown guidelines, allows markets and shops, except shopping malls, to open for full working hours from Monday to Saturday. Shops to remain closed on Sundays. The Supreme Court orders states to ensure all migrant workers reach their villages within 15 days, tells the receiving states to submit schemes for providing employment and welfare to these migrants. Well, here's a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. Even after exhausting all legal options, Vijay Malia won't be returning to India anytime soon. And that is because he has sought asylum in the United Kingdom on humanitarian grounds. My colleague Sanjay Suri joins us now from London with the details. Sanjay, what are you picking up? Vijay Malia's return to India has been delayed because he has sought asylum in the UK on humanitarian grounds particularly over issues arising around Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, to which Britain is a signatory. This article covers torture, but over a period of time, the meaning of this has been expanded to include medical conditions. It is now Malia's case that his right to life and to health would be threatened were he to be sent back to India, and it is on this ground primarily that he has now made this move to resist any return to India. So jail conditions in India are still an issue now and a legal issue, even though a dedicated cell has been set up for him in Mumbai. And that has been considered good enough by the court in the UK and by the court of appeal. Whether Malia wins this or not, certainly this is going to win him some time. Typically, the Home Office takes about six months to decide on an asylum application. It could be a little less, but could well be more if the case is complicated. Following on from that, he could seek an administrative review of a decision were that to go against him. He then has further recourse to a first tier tribunal, which is the judicial body, and then on to a second tier tribunal. Following on from that again, he still would have the option to approach the European Court of Human Rights to stay his return. So while the UK government seems keen to help the Indian government here, it could be some time before Malia returns. Okay. All right, uh, Sanjay Suri, appreciate you joining us. So that is the latest in the Malia matter. Remember, uh, the British High Commission in Delhi had categorically told my colleague Parikshit Lutra that there was a 
pending legal matter that they could not disclose. And uh, that matter is yet to be resolved. And that's now uh, adding up with what Sanjay is reporting. It seems like Vijay Malia has asked for asylum, has sought asylum in the UK. Now, the government is looking at privatizing power distribution companies in union territories by Jan of 2021. The privatization of discoms in union territories was part of the Atmanirbhar announcements made by the finance minister last month. That's not all. We learned that some states like UP, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, among others, have shown interest in privatizing their loss-making discoms. Anshu Sharma joins us now with more. Anshu. Few of announcements were made by the finance minister during the Adhanir Bharat conference, and one of that was privatization of this form, but it was limited to union territories. Now, we understand from sources that uh, by January 2021, uh, the government uh, intends to privatize uh, all the union territories uh, with regards to this form. Now, we also understand that uh, more states are on board with regards to privatization of uh, distribution uh, companies, which are mostly owned by the state governments. Now, we understand that states like Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand, Assam, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, Goa, and Haryana are open to privatization. Of this, uh, Gujarat already has few discounts which are already privatized in uh, Badodara uh, and Surat and uh, Ahmedabad. Now, we also understand that the government may encourage uh, public sector undertakings uh, uh, to encourage uh, joint venture with private companies to get into the distribution uh, business. Uh, now, if you remember, CNBC TV18 had also broken the news that NTPC is quite keen to acquire the BSES led uh, discom assets in New Delhi. Uh, so we understand that uh, uh, this uh, privatization bid uh, will not just be restricted to union territories. And some of the states are now finally uh, waking up to the idea of privatization, considering that the losses on at &T or supply losses have been at 22% in FY19 and close to 19% in uh, in provisional number for FY20. Now the states are actually waking up to do privatization. We'll have to wait and watch out how soon these are fructified. Back to you. All right, Anshu, many thanks for joining us. So the privatization drive as far as discoms in union territories are concerned. Now, the pan-India lockdown has hit the government's revenues hard. Sources say GST collections have stayed under 50,000 crore rupees in April. That's less than half the collections recorded a year ago. Remember, the government had extended the return filing deadline for businesses by 15 days to the 5th of June. Returns filed after the 5th of June will attract a 9% interest if filed till the end of this month. So 49,500 crores till the 5th of June. That is the GST number that's come in. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman today met with heads of public sector banks to take stock of credit disbursal to MSMEs under the emergency credit line scheme. The finance ministers advised banks to maintain a proactive outreach at the branch level. The cabinet had approved the scheme on the 21st of May and so far banks had sanctioned loans worth 20,000 crore rupees under it. The finance ministers also advised bankers to keep forms for the scheme simple and formalities at a minimum. Well, time for us to head into a break, but up next, Nisaba Godridge, the daughter of veteran industrialist Adi Godridge, to take over as the MD and CEO of Godridge Consumer, this in addition to being executive chairman. Details when we return. Nisaba Godridge, daughter of veteran industrialist Adi Godridge, has taken over as the managing director and CEO of Godridge Consumer Products. Her appointment follows the resignation of Vivek Gambhir, who held the position uh, of CEO. Priya Shade joins us now with more. Priya, Nisaba Godridge to take over from Vivek Gambhir, who has resigned for personal reasons. Of course, Nisaba already executive chairman. Well, absolutely. This is a really big move for GCPL. After 11 years uh, at the Godrej Group, Vivek Gambhir will ha has resigned as the MD and CEO of GCPL, citing personal reasons. Now, do remember that uh, Vivek Gambhir has al also been the highest paid FMCG CEO in FY19. But of course, his role will be taken over by Nisaba Godrej, who took over as executive chairperson at GCPL in 2017. Now, a lot of people, um, you know, Nisaba Godrej may not have taken the limelight, but she has been the chief architect architect of GCPL's journey over the last couple of years. Uh, but of course, this exit comes at a time when uh, 
you know, the FMCG market has been under severe pressure. Volumes for GCPL were down about 15% uh, in the last quarter. And even India sales were down 23%. So we'll really have to wait and watch how this shapes up for GCPL because, of course, this is a very critical time. And, and this exit is something that has surprised many on the street. Right, Priya. Thanks very much for joining us. So that uh, is the latest there, a big change uh, coming in for Goodrich Consumer. Let's do a quick check of some of the other headlines that we're tracking. Insurance regulator, the IRDA, has withdrawn the optional long-term comprehensive motor insurance package. Now, these packages included both third-party policy and own damage policy for three or five years. Instead, insurers can now sell long-term third-party policies with own damage policies only for a year. Auto companies have expressed disappointment with the changes they were hoping that this would have been dropped altogether. Financial services company JM Financial plans to raise $100 million via qualified institutional placement. Sources say the indicated price for the issue is at 70 rupees per share. A massive fire has engulfed Assam's Tinsukia district after continuous gas leak from the damaged Bagjan oil well for two weeks. Assam's government requests the centre to send Air Force and Army to help douse the fire. At least 6,000 people living in a radius of 1.5 kilometres have been evacuated to relief camps. Oil India announced financial relief of 30,000 rupees each to the affected families. Well, that is a disturbing story and one that we will be tracking closely. A customer at a shopping mall in Durgapur has raked up a bill of 1,42,000 rupees. Two stores at a Lucknow mall have registered sales worth more than 10 lakh rupees. These are some of the interesting anecdotes emerging out of malls across Indian cities as they open their gates to customers after a gap of more than two months. Several senior mall management executives came together as part of a roundtable organized by the Shopping Centers Association of India to take stock of the trends emerging on day one of the unlock plan. Mugdha Variar joins us now with more. Mugdha. Absolutely interesting highlights from that roundtable which saw senior executives of several malls across the country. So firstly, 250 malls of about 650 large malls which are about 1 lakh uh, square feet in, uh, in space opened up on Monday and about 150 more will open up in the coming days is what the industry was saying. Now malls have opened across cities like Bangalore, Delhi, Hyderabad and even in smaller towns and they're seeing footfall of about a few thousand of customers on Monday. So, uh, for example, Phoenix Mills in Bangalore saw footfall of about uh, 2,000 customers till 2 p.m. on Monday and in Lucknow they saw over 1,000 customers. In Ahmedabad, the Ahmedabad One Mall saw 2,500 customers come in while the Phoenix Market City in Bangalore saw 2,500 customers come in on Monday. But you know really what is interesting is the traction that the smaller uh, town malls really saw on Monday including the customer spends in these malls. For example, the Junction Mall in Durgapur in West Bengal saw 3,000 customers walk in on Monday and one customer in fact spent rupees 1.42 lakhs uh, on purchases on, uh, in the mall is what the CEO of, uh, said in the round table. So that's a big, big bill there. In fact, in Lucknow at the Phoenix United Mall, two stores crossed rupees 10 lakh worth of sales on Monday. And at the Elante Mall in Chandigarh, brands were billing between rupees 40,000 or 50,000 on an average is what the mall management was saying. So definitely, you know, a lot of traction in the smaller towns. And what were customers buying? You know, they were buying electronics, they were buying, buying cosmetics and fashion. In fact, at the Select City Walk Mall in Saket, uh, you know, the, the management said that they saw a lot of sales of Apple phones and MacBook Pros. In the Innovit Mall in Hyderabad, uh, cosmetic stores and salons were seeing 70% of their average weekday sales on Monday alone. Uh, you know, in fact, at Hyderabad, uh, the, the management said that one customer built rupees 20,000 at Shopper Stop. So definitely a big, big, uh, you know, relief for malls and for uh, retailers. Well, they will certainly hope that this continues to be the story, at least as far as the uh, non-metros are concerned. And hopefully, the metros will hope that this is replicated across the large cities too. Mukta, many thanks for joining us. Now to the national capital region, where local authorities have allowed restaurants and malls to open, but with restrictions. However, one is yet to see a rise in footfalls. Today, we visit Cyber Hub in Gurugram, a popular fine dining destination in the NCR. Ritu Bhuyan stepped out to check how the food mall is operating, but found that shutters are still down. And that is because 
There are issues with rentals and rentals being renegotiated. There is also definitional issues because in cities like uh, uh, Guru, Gurugram, uh, particularly malls have not been allowed to reopen. Take a look. This is where the Millennium City parties. Yes, I am in Cyber Hub, Gurgaon. This is the day two of Unlock One for restaurants in NCR region. So how has the response been in Cyber Hub, Gurgaon? Let's find out. As you can see, there are hardly any people here in DLF uh, Cyber Hub Gurgaon, and that's because most of the restaurants are shut. And they'll continue to remain shut uh, till the restaurants have a clarity on a sustainable revenue model. I wanted to have a full meal in Cyber Hub, uh, but uh, very few places uh, are open and they're only doing takeaways. And I guess uh, this will be the situation till restaurants are confident enough to start uh, sit-down meals. Well, that is the picture. Restaurant owners struggling to get their eateries to reopen. With that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. Thanks very much for watching. Do stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. The news will continue.